Good morning. Everybody had a nice break, I hope. We have an outstanding speaker for you this morning, very good and personal friend, Dr. Bill Roberts. Uh, Dr. Roberts received his medical degree from Emory University in 1958 and currently serves as the executive director of the Baylor Cardiovascular Institute. He is also dean of our Department of Continuing Education here and serves as editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Cardiology, which is on our campus, which we're very proud of. And he's held numerous medical school appointments. This includes the professorship in the past at Georgetown University in Washington and his present position of adjunct professor of medicine at Hahnemann in Philadelphia. He's been the recipient of many, many honors, but these have included the Helen Tausick Award and the Gene Drake Memorial Award, both from the American Heart Association, and in 1994 was the recipient of the Distinguished Achievement Award from the Society of Cardiovascular Pathology. Dr. Roberts is author of numerous books, articles, and a renowned lecturer. He's been cited in Who's Who in Government, Who's Who in World Medicine, Who's Who in the South and Southwest, and among American men and women of science. I hope you'll uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Bill Roberts. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Weatherford, for those uh, lovely comments. Uh, wow, I hope the talk is as good as uh, those uh, flattering remarks. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is heart disease. Um, unfortunately, I think there's a, a, con a concept out there that women don't get uh, heart disease, uh, or at least not n nearly as uh, much as men. Uh, I hate to tell you, but that's, that's not the truth. Um, go ahead with the first slide. I'm not doing very well here. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, here it is. Um, this is a coronary artery, and uh, uh, it's terribly narrowed. Oh. Is there a point? Oh, here it is. Uh, it's terribly narrowed, and uh, about half of you folks in this room are going to die from cardiovascular disease. Uh, if you just look at that person next to you, one of you is going to be that uh, victim. I, now, I know it's the other one, not you. Uh, now, of the various cardiovascular diseases, uh, by far the most common is atherosclerosis. Uh, many of us call it hardening of the arteries. You probably know it as hardening of the arteries. But that means that this, th th this space in here is where blood should flow. And here it is, filled up with atherosclerotic plaques. I mean, this is a plague going on uh, in the Western world. And the sad thing is that this is clearly hereditary in one out of 500 people. That means the rest of us, 499 out of 500 of us, we determine whether we fill up our, our arteries with this atherosclerotic plaque or whether we don't. When we pull our chair up to that table 21 times a week, we're making a health statement regarding whether or not we want our arteries to look like that or not. Now, this is a slide that came from uh, uh, Framingham, uh, Massachusetts, where so many good studies have been done in, in uh, healthy people and what percent of them develop heart disease. I, I like this slide because it shows that men, shown here in yellow, uh, have just as many heart attacks from 45 to 64 as after age 65. Now, before you snicker too much, ladies, look at this after 65. Uh, heart attacks after 65 uh, shoot up uh, uh, in women. Indeed, um, this slide shows the frequency of, of death from hardening of the arteries, coronary arteries. Now, coronary arteries are the arteries which supply our heart muscle with, with blood. So these are the arteries that get stopped up by these atherosclerotic plaques. And what we see here, up to age 60, uh, nearly 90% of victims of coronary disease are men. And sudden death is the major problem here. Uh, somebody's watching television at home and suddenly uh, suddenly collapses there. 
uh, that sudden death outside the hospital, a major problem. And what this says is that in men, half of the men with coronary disease never reach age 60. Never reach age 60. So this is not an old person's disease, at least in men. Now, after menopause, that's when you folks uh, come, in, come into play. Now, the, this study here is based on about 1,000 victims of coronary disease. And in this particular study, women were, it, it took to the decade 81 to 90 before there were more deaths in women uh, than in men. But about half the deaths overall, not in this particular study, but overall from coronary disease are in women. Uh, the other half, of course, in men. Let me try to answer these six questions in the rest of this. How much atherosclerosis, and again, atherosclerosis is the hardening of the arteries, the plaque that fills up these arteries. How much of that is needed in the coronary arteries, and the coronary arteries are those arteries which supply our heart muscle with blood to cause myocardial ischemia. Now, myocardial means heart muscle, and ischemia means that that, that heart muscle is not getting enough blood. So how much of this plaque do we have to have? Well, if you try to answer that question from the autopsy table, uh, this, is, this is the answer. Now, acute myocardial infarction is just one, one type of coronary disease, and that means that part of the heart muscle it, dies, and these are the patients who come into the hospital with prolonged chest pain. They go into the coronary care unit. Uh, if we look at the major coronary arteries in the heart, this is the right, the left main, the left anterior descending, the left circumflex. And if we take these arteries and divide them into very little bitty pieces, like five millimeter segments, it turns out that we get about five, 55 per patient per heart, and about a third of the lengths of these arteries, they add up to about like that. That means a third of them third of those links are narrowed 76 to 100 percent in cross-sectional area by plaque alone. Now what I mean by that, I mean if you take a circle and divide it into four quadrants, over three of them are obliterated by this plaque. Now any narrowing less than 75 percent, this is of, of interest. But unless an artery is narrowed over 75% in cross-sectional area, it never causes any problem. So, so what does this mean? How much plaque do, do we need? The answer to that question, we need a whole lot. In other words, we don't get in trouble until we have a whole lot of plaque. Now, that's both good news and bad news. The, the good news is, is that we need a lot before we get in trouble. The bad news is despite the fact that we need a lot of plaque, about half of us go ahead and develop uh, the sufficient quantity uh, to cause trouble. Now, what I've talked about uh, in the last slide are patients with fatal coronary disease. What about patients who are alive with coronary disease and they have symptoms? Do they have just as much narrowing as those people who died from this condition? And unfortunately, the answer to that is yes. Uh, what we see here is a coronary artery but that begins right here, and it goes all the way here and ends here and gives these two branches. Now, we have a surgeon here at Baylor, Dr. Lonnie Witten, wonderful uh, surgeon, but when he does a coronary bypass operation and puts a conduit in the right coronary artery, he takes out the inside of this artery before he puts a conduit in. Now, if we take these arteries where he's taken the inside out and divide them into little bitty five millimeter segments. Lo and behold, we get just as much narrowing in these arteries as we do in the patients with fatal coronary disease. A bit of evidence that by the time we have that first symptom of myocardial ischemia, which indicates that our coronary arteries are terribly narrowed, it means that they are really severely narrow. Now, if we do coronary angiograms, it doesn't look like there's nearly this much narrowing in the coronary arteries. Uh, so I show this slide here to indicate that the amount of narrowing we see on a coronary angiogram is sort of the tip of the iceberg. 
most of that narrowing is, is underneath uh, the surface because that contrast material is injected into the lumen. And you can't see uh, how big that artery was supposed to be uh, because uh, the plaques uh, there. Question two, now what do these atherosclerotic plaques consist of? I'm not talking about the plaques in a 10-year-old child or a 20-year-old young man or woman. I'm talking about these plaques in the 60-year-old man with fatal coronary disease or the 70-year-old woman with fatal coronary disease. And the answer to that question, I won't go into this busy slide, the answer to the question, whether the, their little plaques as shown in this bar or whether the plaques are so big shown in this bar that they, they virtually totally occlude the lumen or they do so, the dominant component of these plaques is fibrous tissue, shown in red and yellow. Now, what is fibrous tissue? Fibrous tissue, of course, is scar tissue. When we cut our arm, it heals by a scar. And this is the dominant component of these plaques. Now, there is some uh, lipid and cholesterol material in these plaques. This stuff shown in green here and the stuff shown in, in dark color, uh, that's lipid. And that lipid material is, is reversible from an experimental standpoint. If we have a very high cholesterol and it comes down, uh, this lipid material uh, can come out of the plaque. Uh, there's no evidence yet for sure that any of this fibrous tissue uh, can be dissolved. Question three, how many direct atherosclerotic risk factors exist? Now, the key word in this uh, question, at least I want it to be, is the word direct. And what I mean by that is what risk factor or factors do you have to have in order to get atherosclerosis? Do you have to be a cigarette smoker to get atherosclerosis? No. So it's not a direct atherosclerotic risk factor. Do you have to have high blood pressure to get atherosclerosis? No. Do you have to be obese to get atherosclerosis? No. Do you have to be a diabetic to get atherosclerosis? No. In my view, you have to have one thing. You have to have a blood total cholesterol level greater than 150. Now, you can smile and say, well, almost everybody in this country over age 20 has a total cholesterol greater than 150. And that's true. And that's why we have so much atherosclerosis in this country. Uh, pure vegetarians, I can tell you, have total cholesterols of 130, 135. So on a natural basis, we can have a much lower level. When we are born, our umbilical blood has a total cholesterol of 75. And then it shoots up to about 150 uh, after about two weeks or a month of life. And then it stays, as a rule, about 150 until we graduate from high school. And then it gradually starts going up after that. There's no reason it has to go up after age 20. We're the ones that make it go up. Now, these factors over here, they do not cause or accelerate atherosclerosis if the total cholesterol is under 150. But if the total cholesterol is over 150, they have an accelerating uh, uh, mechanism. High blood pressure, for example. If you want to prevent stroke, you've got to keep your blood pressure down. Stroke is primarily, primarily a high blood pressure phenomenon. Cigarette smoking, in my view, you just can't be healthy and smoke cigarettes. Uh, lung cancer, emphysema, uh, this is primarily a, a cigarette smoking problem. So, if you're going to remember anything from this talk, remember that number 150. As far as we know, if your total cholesterol is 150 or less, atherosclerotic plaques do not form. So if you want to make sure you don't have atherosclerosis in any portion of your body, whether it's in the heart arteries or whether it's in the carotid arteries in the neck or whether it's in the aorta or whether it's in the peripheral arteries in the legs and so on, uh, just keep the cholesterol, total cholesterol less than 150 uh, and, and you don't have to worry about it. Now, 
This is a slide which shows the percent of our population in the USA aged 20 to about 75 with total cholesterol levels greater than 240. Now that's a very high number. Now look at this. Age 35 to 44, men are shown in yellow here. Their, their cholesterol level shoots up uh, earlier in life. And uh, women, look at you, look at this, ladies. After menopause, after 55 or so, nearly 40% of women in this country, up to age 75, have total cholesterol levels greater than 240. So beware. After menopause, it tends to shoot up. Now, one reason that women look predominant here is that maybe these men with higher levels earlier in life are no longer available to be studied in these, uh, in these later ages here. Men clearly uh, have more atherosclerosis earlier and higher levels earlier. Now, the total cholesterol, as I'm sure you know, is not the total picture. Total cholesterol equals the LDL cholesterol. Now, the L, the L sort of mean, I think of it as lousy. That's the bad one. Uh, so the total equals the LDL cholesterol plus the HDL cholesterol, which is the good one. I think of the H as healthy, plus the triglyceride level divided by five. Now, what we see here is the, um, is the uh, average HDL and LDL in our population uh, age uh, uh, 15 to 20 uh, up to uh, 80. Now, as you see, women here are in yellow and men are in blue. The HDL level, the good one, is generally about the same all of our lives. And women have about a 10 milligram per deciliter higher level uh, than do men. Uh, the LDL, the bad one, uh, up to about age 20, it's about 100 in most of us, both men and women. But then men, it goes up fa faster, uh, uh, so a higher percentage of men have these higher levels younger in life. But again, after menopause, after about 55, you ladies, uh, pass uh, uh, the men. So menopause is a major cutoff point uh, for heart disease uh, in women compared to men. Now, the reason the total goes up after age 20 is primarily because the LDL goes up. But it's not normal to go up. It's not normal for our blood pressure to go up. That's something that, that we do uh, to ourselves uh, for the most part. Question four, what factors indicate that cholesterol causes atherosclerosis? If I'm at a reception or a party and somebody says, oh, that's a doctor over there, and somebody comes up to me and says, doctor, what causes this hardening of the arteries? I say cholesterol. Now, these other factors are important, but they are not the direct cause. It's, it's cholesterol. Now, what are the factors linking cholesterol to atherosclerotic plaques? One of the exciting things about heart disease is that the, there are six factors here. The last three have really been added and confirmed during the past 10 years. So this is, this is exciting data. The, the connection between cholesterol and atherosclerotic plaques has been suspected uh, for over 50 years. But it's now very clear uh, that atherosclerotic plaques uh, are caused uh, by cholesterol. Now, this all started back in 1908 by some Russian physiologists who, had, who fed, well, first they fed raw red meat, then they fed uh, 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 fat, and then they fed pure egg yolks, which is essentially cholesterol, to certain animals. Now, which ones did they pick? They picked rabbits. You can only produce atherosclerosis in an herbivore. You can give your dog a cat all the cholesterol you want, and you cannot produce an atherosclerotic plaque. The only way you can produce an atherosclerotic plaque uh, in a carnivore is to first take out the thyroid gland. 
Uh, now, if you take a human being and just pour cholesterol and pour saturated fat into that human being over a long period of time, can you produce an atherosclerotic plaque? Of course. That means, folks, basically, fundamentally, we are herbivores, not carnivores. So when you pull your chair up to that table and eat that uh, cow and that pig and that chicken uh, later today, you might keep that in mind. Because if we move more toward the herbivore side, uh, the health of this nation uh, would skyrocket. Now the second thing that was found was, was the biochemists looked into the arteries in human beings and they saw those plaques and they plucked them out and then they ground them up and lo and behold, they found cholesterol within them. The third thing happened after World War II when Ansel Keys, and I'll come back to this, and his colleagues went to uh, several countries around the world and they examined a lot of people to see if they had evidence of heart disease. And lo and behold, they found that people whose cholesterol levels were over 150 they had a pretty high frequency of heart disease, and those with cholesterol levels under 150 had a very, very low frequency of heart disease. And then these studies four, five, and six have really come, as mentioned earlier, in the past 10 years. The higher the blood total cholesterol level, and specifically the higher the LDL cholesterol level, that's the bad one, the greater the chance of having symptomatic atherosclerotic disease, the greater the chance of dying from it, and the greater the extent of these plaques at the time of autopsy. Lowering the blood total cholesterol level decreases the chances of fatal or non-fatal atherosclerotic disease. Now, what does that mean? It means if you take a group of people who have no evidence of heart disease, and they have cholesterol levels up here. And if you lower the cholesterol levels down to here, and if you compare those people with lowered levels to those who didn't lower their levels, there's a much less frequency of heart attack in this group uh, than in the group who did not lower their levels. Now, the sixth, the last thing here, most of these studies have come since 1990. And that is, if you take a group of people who've already had a heart attack and their cholesterol levels are up here. And if you lower their levels down to here, and, uh, the frequency of a heart attack in the, those with lower levels compared to those who didn't lower their levels is enormously less. Now, that's wonderful news. That means if you have a heart attack, you don't need to give up. If you lower that cholesterol level, the chances of a second heart attack uh, diminish enormously. Now, this is Ansel Key's famous seven nation study. He, he, he went to these seven countries, studied about 13,000 people, and found that people residing in, let's say, Japan and Greece had a very low frequency of symptomatic heart disease, whereas those in the USA and Finland a very high frequency. These studies were done in the 1960s. And Ansel Keys concluded, well, in southern Japan, the group he studied, the average total cholesterol was 150. And in East Finland, though, that was the highest group, it was approaching 300. Now, at that time, in the early 1960s, most of the Japanese were pure vegetarians or only, uh, the only flesh they ate w w was fish. Uh, whereas in East Finland, uh, my goodness, they ate, uh, and only 10% of their calories were coming from fat in Japan at that time. In East Finland, 45% of their calories were coming from fat, 45%, over four times as much fat was consumed by the Finnish compared to the Japanese. Now, this study was published in 1986. It's very important in my view because of the huge number of people studied. Now, unfortunately, I hate to say this, ladies, these were all men. But we've learned subsequently that these past studies, uh, which were done in men, are, are, are also applicable uh, in women. Uh, the ages are just different. Women have developed heart disease about 10 years later uh, than do uh, men. But look at this study. Uh, uh, the, these uh, folks uh, 
with 35 to 57 when they entered the study, they were divided into 10 groups according to their serum total cholesterol level. And what we see as that level goes up, 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 and up, the coronary artery disease mortality, and this is only a six-year mortality, it's higher at 10, it's higher at 12, it's higher at 15, goes up, 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 and up. No study shows it better, that the higher the cholesterol level, the greater the chance of having heart disease. It's not only what that cholesterol number is, it's also how long have you had that number. If you have a total cholesterol, let's say, of 290 for one year, that's not so bad. But if you have a total cholesterol of 290 for 30 years, you've got a major problem uh, on your hands. Now this slide summarizes what are called the primary prevention studies. The primary prevention studies are the studies which were done on healthy people. And uh, uh, the populations uh, chosen for these primary prevention studies are people with very high cholesterol levels, so one gets enough events so that you can make uh, some predictions. But what these studies show, uh, if you look at the total cholesterol level, uh, if the total cholesterol level is lowered by 10%, now that means to go from 200 to 180. If you lower it by 10%, you decrease your chance of a heart attack by 30%. Now that's the kind of company I want to invest in. For every 1%, you lower your total cholesterol level. You decrease your chance of a heart attack by 3%. You get three for one. Now, uh, this is the first study and probably the only one that will ever be done on uh, a, primary, a primary prevention trial using a statin drug. Now, the statin drugs are the drugs uh, which lower cholesterol level. They're, they're miracle drugs in my view. I'll come back to that point. But these statin, we now have five statin drugs. The first one appeared, uh, lovastatin appeared in 1987. And since that time, we've had four additional ones. A new one came out this year, and maybe another new one will come out before the year is over. But this is the only study we have uh, taking healthy people with high cholesterol levels, putting them on this statin drug. Now, the one used here was, uh, was Provostatin or Provacol. And then these people were followed for uh, a little over five years and compared to the group uh, who were not put on the drug. And look what happened in this study. The average total cholesterol in this population was 262 at the beginning. Uh, coronary artery death uh, decreased. All of these things decreased about 30% or so. Non-fatal myocardial infarction, now heart attack decreased. Definite heart attack death decreased. Uh, Angiopl need for angioplasty or bypass surgery decreased enormously. All cardiovascular deaths decreased and, a, and even total mortality decreased. Death from anything decreased. Uh, so th these are really uh, miracle drugs which I'll, I'll come back to. Now, the evidence is so clear that if you take a group of people with high cholesterol levels and lower them, uh, that, that the frequency of heart attack will be reduced. The FDA will not permit a, a new primary prevention trial to be done. So we're not going to ever, I don't think, have this kind of trial uh, again. Now this slide summarizes the 4S study. Now 4 means that the number of people studied were 4,444 and the S means it either took place in the five Scandinavian countries, which it did, or S stands for simvastatin, which is another statin drug. Uh, most of you probably know that one by the name Zocor. It's the, uh, it's the most popular of the statin drugs uh, at the moment. Now, again, in this study, just like the other one, the average total cholesterol was about 262. And in contrast to the first study where they studied healthy people, 
All of the people in this study already had a heart attack. 80% had acute myocardial infarction, which had healed. In other words, part of their heart muscle was dead. And the other 20% had angina pectoris. Uh, so we're dealing with a group of people who already had a heart attack. And these people were put on simvastatin, either 20 or 40 milligrams a day, and look what happened. Total mortality, that's death from anything, uh, decreased about 26%. Coronary mortality, means heart attack, decreased 42%. You can't give any drug to anybody who's had a heart attack and decrease the frequency of a subsequent heart attack like this drug will do it. Major coronary events of any type decreased about 37%. And look at this. Need for angioplasty and bypass operation decreased 37%. Now, I can tell you in the five Scandinavian countries, a bypass operation and angioplasty are not performed nearly as frequently as they are in this country. Indeed, we do three times as many angioplasties in the USA as done in the Scandinavian countries, and three times as many bypasses in this country as done in the Scandinavian countries. And I think these are good procedures. But if you decrease those frequencies by 37% in the countries where they're not doing many of these procedures, think what a cost reduction would occur in this country where everybody who had a heart attack given one of these statin drugs. And I have no stocks in any pharmaceutical company. Uh, I'm not pushing uh, these uh, magical drugs in my view because it would be a benefit to me. Uh, uh, I don't think it's really appropriate for physicians to own stocks in medical device companies or in pharmaceutical companies, and I don't. I'm editor of a medical journal also, and I particularly think it's not appropriate for medical editors to own stocks in pharmaceutical companies. The point of all this is that the benefit of these statin drugs, this happened to be Zocor, Simvastatin, was enormous uh, after a heart attack. Now, We've had a third, or another uh, a study, which also is called a secondary prevention trial, uh, which was published last year called the CARE study. Now, the thing that's important about the CARE study is that everybody who entered this study, they also had a heart attack, acute myocardial infarction, and that infarct healed. But um, their average total cholesterol was only 207. In order to get in this study, you had to have a total cholesterol less than 240, whereas the average total cholesterol in the other study, the, Mr. the uh, 4S study, the average total cholesterol here was 262. The average cholesterol in this study was 207. So we're talking about heart attacks in people with much lower cholesterol levels. And it turns out, um, most people with heart attacks don't have these very high cholesterol levels because they're relative, relatively infrequent. Most people who have heart attacks have total cholesterols between 200 and, 20, and 240. But look what this study found. Uh, everything was benefited. Now here was a group of about 5,000 people followed for nearly six years Half were put on a statin drug. This was provostatin or provocol, and the other half weren't. Now, those were put on the drug. Fatal heart attack decreased 37%. Coronary death or, or non-fatal heart attack was decreased uh, 26%. Coronary death uh, was decreased over 20%. Non-fatal infarction decreased. Need for angioplasty and bypass uh, decreased about 25%. And look at this, stroke. Stroke is much worse than a heart attack. I'm, I'd much rather have a heart attack than stroke. But look at this, stroke was decreased over 30% in those people who had already had a heart attack and were put on this statin drug. Now, the same thing occurred in the 4S study those with high levels who had had a heart attack. Stroke frequency decreased dramatically uh, uh, in, in the group put on the drug compared to those not put on the drug. Now this slide attempts to summarize both the 4S study and the CARE study. 
Uh, now, on this vertical axis here, uh, the, this is the chance of, of having a, a, a coronary event, be it a heart attack or angina or bypass or angioplasty or anything. Uh, the 4 s study, the people started with total cholesterol levels of 262, and they came down here to total cholesterol levels just under 200. The CARE study started with an average total cholesterol of 207, and it came down here to about uh, 160. Now, what this shows, this is a remarkable slide. It costs millions of dollars, folks, to get this data which is summarized on a simple slide, which costs uh, less than a dollar, really, uh, to make. But what we see is if you've had a heart attack, it doesn't matter what your total cholesterol level is. If you can lower it, you're better off. Now, even in the 4S study, um, the goal was to get total cholesterol to less than 200. Suppose the goal had been to get it to less than 150. And it could have been done, just higher doses would have been needed. I think if, if, the do, if it had gone to less than 150, the frequency of a heart attack uh, would have dropped dramatically uh, more. Now this slide uh, has to do with a new study which was published last month. This study is called the post coronary Artery Bypass Graph Trial. Now what this means is, is that all of the patients in this trial had already had a bypass operation. Uh, the bypass operation had been anywhere from one to 11 years earlier. And when they entered the study, uh, half of the group were put on what is called, a, what they called aggressive treatment. And the average, uh, lovastatin was the drug, that's Mevacor, uh, was 76 milligrams per patient and then in the group called moderate, see, you can't have a placebo group anymore, a control group, really, because the evidence is so overwhelming that these statin drugs are beneficial um, that you can't, you can't have a group of patients that you're not treating anymore. Well, this is almost a placebo group because they received an average of four milligrams of lovastatin a day. Uh, and what happened? Uh, this group got their LDL, that's the bad one, to under 100. And this group had their LDL uh, only reduced slightly, one, uh, to in the 130s. Well, this was primarily an angiographic trial. Uh, the graphs were looked at and the native orders were looked at at the beginning of the trial and then several years later. Uh, now this showed, that what this says is that there were more narrowings in this group with the higher cholesterol levels than in the group with the lower cholesterol levels. There were a lot fewer new narrowings in this group compared to this group. Deaths were less in this group compared to this group. Myocardial infarction, heart attacks uh, were less. So what this shows is that it really pays big dividends uh, to be on these drugs after a bypass operation. Uh, now, some of these people didn't enter it until 11 years later. Just think what the result would have been if these people had been put on the statin drug immediately after the bypass operation and kept on it in sufficient quantities. I don't think, I think anybody who has a bypass operation or angioplasty, if they're not put on a statin drug thereafter, that they've not received uh, a real adequate uh, procedure. And I, I think these procedures are excellent. Now this complicated slide here summarizes a lot of different studies. These are called angiographic studies. And again, these patients had angiograms which demonstrated narrowings in a coronary artery, one or more. And then they were put on these various drugs or other lipid lowering, cholesterol lowering regimes. And then they were followed up to one year or, or up to four years. And then a repeat angiogram was done. And what these studies, every one of them show uh, that the amount of narrowing in those coronary arteries was a bit less in the group treated with a cholesterol-lowering drug compared to the other group. But even more important than that is that those patients who were treated with a cholesterol-lowering regime, and in one of these studies, it was a pure vegetarian diet, this one right here, pure vegetarian diet. Um, the frequency of new heart attacks dropped 
considerably, up to 89% in this study, 50% in this study, 80%, 70%. It pays big dividends after a heart attack or after one has coronary narrowing uh, to be put on these drugs. Now, evidence of regression occurs. Plaque shrinkage occurs. How does it come about? We don't know the answer to that for sure because you can only do an autopsy once. But the speculation is this. If you have a heart attack, you know you've got one or more arteries which are narrowed greater than 75% in cross-sectional area. That is, if you have a circle and divide it into four quadrants, over three of them are obliterated by plaque. Now, about 10% of that plaque is lipid. If we can take that lipid and reduce it from here to here, we can open up that plaque so that, it is, so that the lumen, the space through which blood flows, is less than 75% narrowed. And it's an engineering principle that you have to narrow a tube, a pipe, a coronary artery over 75% in cross-sectional area before flow is actually diminished. What does this mean? It means if we can get the lumen so that it is narrowed less than 75% in cross-sectional area, that is as if there's no narrowing at all. So these things are highly beneficial. Question five, how can symptomatic atherosclerosis be prevented? And if present, how can it be arrested? The answer, 150. Total cholesterol, the challenge, if you have a total cholesterol of 150, a major challenge in your life is to keep it there. If your cholesterol level is greater than that and you don't want to form an atherosclerotic plaque, it's up to you, it's up to me, it needs to come down to 150. Now question six, how can we do that? How can normal cholesterol levels be prevented from rising and how can elevated levels be lowered to normal? Well, that's a rub. We all know how to do that. We've got to do three things. We've got to decrease the quantity of cholesterol we take in. We've got to decrease the quantity of saturated fat we take in. And we've got to decrease almost certainly the quantity of total calories we take in. Now this slide has to do with cholesterol. Three different groups of investigators, they all show the same thing. As we increase our cholesterol uptake in our diets, our cholesterol in the blood goes up. Now, it doesn't work perfectly in any of us. This is the way it works in groups of people. Some of us can eat three eggs and our cholesterol level will shoot up. Others of us can eat three eggs and it doesn't change much. But in groups of people, the more cholesterol we take in, the higher our blood cholesterol level. A friend of mine, Bill Castelli, talks about the egg sucker from Chicago. This is a fellow who, who drilled a hole in 35 eggs every day, <coughs> excuse me, and sucked the contents of those eggs out. His total cholesterol level went up to 750, and Bill Castelli convinced him to throw away those eggs, and it immediately fell down uh, to 200. Now, actually, I don't worry so much about cholesterol. You can't believe that statement, I'm sure, after what I've been talking about. But what I mean by that is that, as we all know, cholesterol comes from animals and their products. So if we don't eat animals and their products, we don't eat cholesterol. Uh, and interestingly, all flesh, whether it's from cows or pigs or chickens or turkeys or fish, gram for gram have the same amount of cholesterol. The difference is the amount of fat. And fish, uh, compared to the other flesh, have relatively little fat in them. Now, most, uh, about half of our cholesterol comes from eggs, uh, the visible and non-visible ones we eat. And most of the rest of it comes from cows. We call it beef, but it's really bovine muscle. And that's 28%, and milk is nine, and cheese is five, and butter is four. So if we eliminate eggs, and if we eliminate cows, we have clearly beat the cholesterol issue. Actually, the amount of cholesterol most of us take in is about 400, 300, 500 milligrams a day. It's hardly enough to get a calorie out of it. Now, how do you picture 500 milligrams? I can tell you that a toothpick weighs 100 milligrams. 
So none of us take in more than the equivalency of five toothpicks or four toothpicks every day. Now, fat is the real villain. Uh, the problem with fat is that it's everywhere. Uh, and about a third of it is saturated. And it's the saturated component that shoots up our cholesterol level. Now, how does saturated fat cause our cholesterol levels to go up? That's been a very tough question to answer. But the way it apparently works and appears to work is that the saturated fat we take in, when it comes into our bodies, it's converted to cholesterol. So our biggest source of cholesterol is not the direct stuff we take in, but that which comes in through the saturated fat channel. Now, saturated fat in the US the average American takes in over 140 grams, grams, uh, not milligrams, of fat every day. And let's say we take in 120 grams. Uh, women take in more, less fat than men uh, as a rule. If we take in 140 grams as a rule, that means about a third of it, 40 grams, is saturated. So if we take in 40 grams of saturated fat, that's a lot to convert uh, to cholesterol. Uh, I used to say that it was the person uh, in the kitchen uh, that was determining our fate. Uh, now I think it's the, I've changed that, it's the person who does the shopping that determines our fate. So if you bring a lot of saturated fat home, you know what's going to happen to it. Uh, if you bring a lot of bacon home and potato chips and all that stuff, uh, you know what's going to happen to it. So those decisions in the grocery store are major, major health decisions. Uh, every fatty acid has the saturated component, the monounsaturated, and the polyunsaturated. The saturated raise our cholesterol levels, and these others either have a neutral effect or they actually lower them. Now, we need to avoid these in this column. Look at coconut oil, 92% saturated. That's a disaster. Palm kernel oil, 86% saturated. Butterfat, 66%. There's a good bit of evidence that monounsaturated is better for us than polyunsaturated. Now look at olive oil. Olive oil is 77% monounsaturated. If you just have to eat an egg, cook it in olive oil. You know, those Greeks and Italians, they have a lot less atherosclerosis than we do. I was in Italy in uh, last uh, December, and. I stayed in a couple's house. They never buy butter at a grocery store. The only thing they got is olive oil. They put that uh, on everything. Now, if you want to get a good grease job quickly, there's no better place than the fast uh, uh, food industry. 75 million Americans eat at a fast food chain every day. McDonald's alone has 15,000 outlets around the world. Uh, uh, Big, what's the other one, uh, Burger King, they have, uh, uh, th they have about 8,000 now. I mean, this is big deal. You're talking about a holocaust going on. Ask the cows about that. Uh, uh, at any rate, uh, uh, the young people are the ones that go to these fast food chains. I'm, I'm worried that we're going to have a resurgence of atherosclerosis. For many years, about 20 years, it was going down. It, it, it's flattened off. I'm afraid it may start going up again. Uh, kids tend to grow up on this stuff. McDonald's didn't get started to 1955, and they really didn't get swinging until about 1970 or so. These are the ingredients of the hamburgers and, and some of the top ones. Uh, at, this keeps changing, but at the moment, it's Carl's Jr. Double Western Bacon Cheeseburger. <laughs> Folks, that's the Cornell Artery Bypass Special. And it's got about 1,000 calories in it, and if you squeeze that sucker real hard, you can come up with about 14 teaspoons of fat, and much of that is saturated. Now, none of us should eat over 1,800 milligrams of sodium. This is sodium, not salt, not sodium chloride, sodium alone. None of us should eat over 1,800 milligrams a day. We'd all be better off if we ate less, but you can get all that in Carl's Jr., no problem. <laughs> I'll have the half-pound double deluxe bacon steer burger, please. You want chemotherapy with that? I think that's, a, that's the truth. There was a book appeared in the USA a, a few years ago. The author entitled it, In One Day. 
he asked the question, what do we consume in the USA every 24 hours? Well, about 815 billion calories of food, roughly 200 billion more than we need. Now those 200 billion every day would feed the country of Mexico every day, no problem. In 1990, folks, we reached 60 percent. Three out of every five Americans age 18 and over are overweight, 60 percent. When I was at NIH, uh, uh, which I was for several decades, uh, we had a lot of foreign visitors. And every time one would walk into my office, I would always ask, what strikes you most about Americans? And of course, that produced a lot of different answers. But answer number one is how many fat people we have in the USA. Uh, the Japanese come over here. The Europeans come over here. Uh, they, they, they smile at us. Nearly 100,000 cattle are slaughtered every day in the USA, yielding 60 million pounds of red meat. As you know, we've got about 265 million Americans and about 100 million cows, and we kill about 100,000 of them every day. We do it differently in the USA and Canada, as you know, compared to the rest of the world. We bring them into these feedlots their last five to six months of life. They don't do this in Europe. Uh, and there, uh, we feed them 20, 25 pounds of grain and soybean every day. Why do we do that? We do that, of course, to make them fat. Because when they're fat, they taste better. And then we kill them, and then they kill us. And that's the way, that's the, way the system works. Now, in addition to that, we, we kill about 250,000 hogs every day. And many of them never touch planet Earth during their entire existence here. And we eat about 4 million pounds of bacon. It's, bacon is really the pits. It's about 80, 85% pure fat. Now, if you don't know what it is, make a hot dog out of it. And we eat about 47 million of them every day. McDonald's puts 2,500 cows on their tables every day. Dairy cows, you'll fill 47 million gallons of milk every day. And folks, if you're a chicken, don't wander into the USA. This is now, we're now up to 19 million chickens killed in the USA every day, and many of them never touch planet Earth. We eat about 170 million eggs. We, we eat 50 million pounds of sugar every day. Look at this, an average of 21 teaspoons apiece. Can you imagine waking up in the morning, looking at your bedside table, and seeing 21 teaspoons of sugar out there? These processed foods we all eat, and I'm guilty of this uh, too, just like everyone. Uh, it's so convenient. Uh, they're loaded with sugar. Uh, and they're loaded with salt. We drink about 16 million gallons of beer and ale and 1.5 million gallons of hard liquor, enough to make 26 million Americans thoroughly drunk every day. <laughs> about 3,000 to 4,000 teenagers take up smoking every day. I like this statement by William Collins. He says, the carnivore animal has almost an unlimited capacity to, to, to handle saturated fats and cholesterol, whereas the vegetarian and herbivorous animals have a very restricted capacity to handle these food components. It is virtually impossible to produce atherosclerosis in the dog, even when 100 grams of cholesterol, now that's 200 times the average daily intake for humans in the USA, plus a quarter pound of butter fat are added to its meat ration. In contrast, Adding only two grams of cholesterol daily to a rabbit's chow for two months produces striking fatty changes in its arterial wall. Now, are we more like the rabbit or more like the dog? Let's take a peek at that. Now, when you look down at your appendages, do you see claws or do you see these hands we're supposed to be using for gathering these fruits and vegetables we're supposed to be eating? Now, there are those who argue, well, the teeth in the front of the mouth are sharp, but most of our teeth are flat uh, for grinding. Now, the intestinal tract of a, of a dog or a cat, carnivores, is very short. You know, you give them something to eat, they gotta go outside in a few minutes. But the, the intestinal tract of a human being is long. The small intestine of a human, you could readily stretch across this stage if you just uh, pulled it uh, just a speck, very long. Now, when you cool your body, you pant like a dog or do you sweat or, or perspire, I mean? When you drink water, do you lap it like your cat or do you sip it? I don't know any human beings that make their own vitamin C. Of course, we obtain it from our diet. Folks, I think we think we're one of these carnivores and we certainly conduct our lives as if we were. 
but I would suggest, as have many others, that basically, fundamentally, this is the group we belong in, and I'm absolutely convinced, unless we move more to the right, the health of this nation will not improve. Nuclear cardiology is not gonna improve the health of this nation. When we pull our chair up to the table, 21 times a, meet, a week, if we require meat, flesh, and so on to eat at every one of those meals, our, our health will not improve. 21 times a week, just cut it down. If you have to have meat or flesh, bring it down to five times a week, four times a week, three times a week. Uh, I'm not perfect by a long shot. Uh, I, I was a pure vegetarian for 18 months. It's very hard. Uh, I eat uh, 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 fish now. Uh, these are some diseases that pure vegetarians don't get. Uh, there's a lot of information on this. It's not that they never get it, but they're very uncommon in pure vegetarians. Look at number one, atherosclerosis. Half of this room is going to die from atherosclerosis. Pure vegetarians don't get it. High blood pressure. We have 160 million Americans over age 20. 60 million, 60 million have high blood pressure. The pure vegetarians don't get it. Societies that eat no salt, their blood pressure is 90 over 60, and it stays 90 over 60 an entire lifetime, an entire lifetime. Look at this, ladies, cancer of the breast. Cancer of the breast may be hereditary in about 5%, but not in the other 95%. Cancer of the breast, very uncommon in pure vegetarian societies. Cancer of the colon, uncommon. I saw an article a while back. Heavy meat eaters have a much higher frequency of cancer of the prostate among men, of course, uh, than the light meat eaters. Diabetes after age 50 is almost unheard of in pure vegetarian societies. They're not obese. They're not bothered by peptic ulcer, constipation, hemorrhoids, diverticulosis, appendicitis. Now, some of this got started uh, by a surgeon. Uh, in, uh, in Kampala, Uganda, in Africa, right after World War II. He went over there uh, to that uh, beautiful country on the equator and, and noted that in patients he was operating on, he didn't see any diverticulitis. He wasn't operating on anybody with uh, appendicitis. Hemorrhoids were extremely uncommon. And it's from that that all of this other information uh, uh, was garnered. Look at this. Gallstones, kidney stones, very uncommon in pure vegetarians. And ladies, take a look at this, osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is uh, considerably more common in women uh, than in men. Uh, there are some people, a lot of people actually, who believe, or as you know, by age 65, it's estimated in this nation that 35% of the skeleton of women has been lost in this country. 35% by age 65. Why? There are some who believe that it's because we take in too much protein. Uh, to, the more protein we take in, the more calcium we lose uh, in the urine. This slide, it took World War II to produce, unfortunately, 1939 to 1945. And as you know, during that period of time, in certain countries, there was not much meat and not much butter and not much cheese and not much milk. And what happened to the cardiovascular death rate? Well, in Sweden, boom, it fell. In Finland, boom, it fell. In Norway, boom, it fell. In the USA, it just kept on going up. Can we change our health? Of course we can change our health. This slide has to do with body weight and when we die. The authors called it mortality ratio. It's based on 20 studies uh, having to do with body weight uh, and mortality. And what this shows is whether you're man or whether you're woman, the more we weigh, the sooner we die. Now, we can all point out the Winston Churchills on the planet, but in groups of people, the more we weigh, the sooner we die. Now, this slide has to do not with just overweightness, but with obesity. Obesity is defined as greater than 20% over ideal body weight. So if you're supposed to weigh 160, you weigh 200. And look at this. No nation on, history, on the planet has the problem of obesity that we face in the USA. Look at this, black women. Over 40% of black women in this nation are not just overweight, but obese. Black men, white women, white men, 25%. Not just overweight. Obese, a major problem in this nation. 
Uh, this slide has to do with cancer of the breast. Well, why is he talking about cancer of the breast? On the horizontal axis here is the grams of fat consumed by adults in these various countries around the world. And here we are, USA, right up here. We're consuming over 140 grams of fat in adults in this country, and we have one of the highest frequencies of cancer of the breast. You folks in this room have about a one in eight or one in nine chances of having cancer of the breast. You have about one in two chances of having cardiovascular disease. Now the reason I show this is although this happens to be cancer of the breast, it could just as easily be cancer of the colon, or it could just as easily be high blood pressure, or it could just as easily be atherosclerosis. The lower the quantity of fat consumed by any society, the lower the frequency of our two most common cardiovascular conditions, namely atherosclerosis and high blood pressure, and two of our three most common cancers, namely cancer of the breast and cancer of the colon. The most commonly prescribed diet by physicians in this country is what's called a 30% of calories from fat. That's what you want to know about any food is percent of calories from fat. Now, when you go into the grocery store and you see 2% milk, uh, that doesn't help you too much. Uh, uh, whole milk is 4% fat by weight, but it's 50% fat as a percent of calories. The only good milk is skim milk, and that's virtually uh, zero calories. So you don't want to know percent of, of fat by weight, but percent of calories from fat. 2% milk is 33% fat as a percent of calories. At any rate, the most commonly prescribed diet by physicians is this 30% of calories from fat. If you lower your percent of calories from fat per day from 40 to 30, you lower your total cholesterol by 5%, you lower your LDL by 5%. That's on an average. In other words, dieting to that extent is not greatly helpful in lowering cholesterol levels. Uh, there's variability. Some people get a 20% drop. Others actually go up but on the average, you can count on only a 5% reduction. In order to, to lower cholesterol levels predictably uh, by dieting alone, one needs to be down here about 20% of calories from fat. The pure vegetarians are down here about 10% of calories from fat. Uh, that's hard. Now these are the cholesterol statin drugs uh, that, that are presently available. Uh, there are five of them. The, this one just came out uh, uh, a month or so ago. Uh, S is simvastatin here, or Zocor. L is lovastatin or Mevacor. And P is provastatin or Provacol. These are, the, these are the, the ones that have the most studies on them uh, by far and, uh, and have proven uh, efficacy and, and proven safety. Atorvastatin or Lipitor here is, is the new uh, player on the block. Uh, these are magical drugs. Uh, when penicillin came out, I can send a p penicillin a magical drug. Uh, when penicillin came out, doctors clamored for it, and the pharmaceutical companies hadn't figured out uh, how to produce it in mass quantities. It took a, took a long time to do that. These drugs are underutilized. We have, in this country, about 40 million Americans with total cholesterols greater than 240. We have in this country at least 10 million. Some people estimate it at 15 million. People with symptomatic atherosclerosis, coronary arteries, carotid arteries, aorta, peripheral arteries, 15 million. Now, what is the total number of people in this country on one of these statin drugs? I think it's, it's no more than 3 million. So we're talking about a bottomless pit. One of the problems with these drugs is that Medicare won't pay for them. If you want a bypass operation or if you want angioplasty, they'll pay for that, no problem. But these drugs are magical. They are miracle drugs. And in my view, uh, they should be used a lot more. And the safety factors here is, is amazing. It's, it's wonderful. I, I was in Washington, D.C. the other day and uh, spoke on a program with a uh, uh, the cholesterol guru from the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and he told this audience of several hundred people that he had, in, in his entire experience in 10 years, had never seen one patient uh, taking these drugs whose liver enzymes went up greater than three times the upper limit of normal. 
Well, that, that was uh, pretty good. Certainly an occasional patient they go up, uh, but uh, that's very uncommon. And the chances of, of and, and there's been no permanent liver damage from any of these drugs. These are the um, uh, indications for drug therapy according to an, the adult treatment panel of the National Cholesterol Education Program. Now, I disagree with these recommendations. And interestingly, there was not a single cardiologist on this adult treatment panel. Most of these people were endocrinologists or, or general internists. There wasn't a single cardiologist on this panel. Everything that was based on LDL cholesterol, or, or not, that was the major thing, not everything. If you didn't have any other risk factors like smoke cigarettes or be a man or have high blood pressure or diabetes, or have evidence of coronary disease, the magical number was 190 with the goal of getting it under 160. If you had other risk factors like being a man or have high blood pressure, the magical number was 160 with the goal of getting it under 130. But if you've already had a heart attack or peripheral vascular disease or carotid disease, the magical number was 130 with the goal of getting it to under 100. Now, if it is useful to get this to less than 100 after a heart attack, isn't it logical that it would be useful to get it to less than 100 before a heart attack? Well, I think it would be. Now, the problem is this, this is political in a way. If, if these numbers were picked so that, so that not too many of the American population would be frightened, but, but I think we should know what the goal is and all of us should try to get our LDLs to less than 100. And the evidence is pretty strong, at least in my view, that if your LDL is less than 100, you will not form an atherosclerotic plaque. In my view, anybody who's had a, any evidence of atherosclerosis, any event from it, ought to be on one of these statin drugs, and no exceptions to that, and I don't really care what the cholesterol levels are in somebody who's had a heart attack. If they've had a heart attack, whatever those levels are, they're too high. Now, it's very important that these levels be checked when the person comes into the hospital, not on the day that they were leaving the hospital. One of my uh, medical friends here in the hospital showed me a couple of months ago, he'd had a heart attack and he had a bypass operation, and he showed me his numbers and his total cholesterol uh, was 154, and his LDL was 80, and his HDL was, uh, was not bad. And he said, why did I have a heart attack? He says, you cholesterol folks, y'all don't know what you're doing. Well, it turned out that he had those levels done uh, on the second day after he had a bypass operation. And one of the best ways of lowering total and all these cholesterol levels is to go on cardiopulmonary bypass. It drops the cholesterol levels about 50%, uh, and it takes about two weeks before it go goes uh, uh, up to its usual level. Angioplasty, or just being in the hospital, will drop it a little bit. So it's important to know what it is when you first come into the hospital. Now, about one out of 500 people have this familial hypercholesterolemia. If you've got familial hypercholesterolemia, and one of the easy ways of knowing that, if you've got a relative who had a heart attack in their 40s, or if you've got a total cholesterol over 300 and you don't have thyroid disease or something else, uh, you probably got familial variety and you need to be on one of these drugs. Now, I think in the next few years, a lot of these patients in between here are gonna be treated. I'll tell you, if I had diabetes mellitus, uh, boy, I'd be on a statin drug right away. Half the people with diabetes die from heart disease. Um, so I think the indications, uh oh, I'm about done here, folks. One second. This is the next to the last slide, a third from last. This is a wonderful study. This is a study that came out only last month. And the beauty of this study is that the people being studied all had angina. And... Uh, half of the group were put on lovastatin, which is one of the statin drugs, and treated six months. And then their frequency of angina was compared to the other group at the end of six months. And what we see here is that these statin drugs are anti-ischemic drugs. In other words, they help the heart muscle get more blood. If you have a heart attack, if you have angina, and you can only take one drug, 
The best drug to take by far is one of these statin drugs. Uh, they have the most benefit of all. Now these are coronary arteries in a woman who was 103 years of age. I show them to point out how great they are. This is her left main. It's just beautiful. I'll trade with her right now. This is her right. That's the biggest plaque in her body right there. This is the left anterior descending. This is the artery, big one that runs in the front of the heart. Now the reason I show this is simply to point out that we don't have to get atherosclerosis just because we're getting older. This is not a degenerative disease. We are the degenerates, I'm afraid. This lady was uh, run over by an automobile. Uh, in summary, by the time coronary atherosclerotic disease is diagnosed clinically, the process is extensive and diffuse and most of the plaque is not reversible because fibrous tissue or scar tissue is the dominant component. The first clinical manifestation of coronary atherosclerosis is the last in about 25% of the patients because the first manifestation is fatal. I didn't even get into that. Uh, people, the average, the, the, the most common mode of death from coronary disease is sudden death. And sudden death is the initial manifestation in about 25% of the victims. Even though lipid lowering therapy after an atherosclerotic event is of proven benefit, the frequency of recurrent events is high unless one tries to get that total cholesterol down to 150 or the LDL to under 100. If you do that, it's not very great at all. Preventing coronary events would eliminate about 90% of patients of cases of congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is the most common cause of admission to a hospital of the Medicare population. And it's the hospital admissions that cost so much money. And 90% of cases of malignant ventricular arrhythmias because 90% of them are due to hardening of the arteries, are due to atherosclerosis. In my view, the emphasis needs to change from decreasing the risk of atherosclerotic events to actually preventing and arresting atherosclerosis. And unless we're willing to be pure vegetarians, that requires more lipid-lowering drug therapy administered earlier and at higher doses. Thank you very much for your attention. Lights on. Yes, ma'am. Do you know? Yeah. Absolutely, it's your health, it's your body. That's my recommendation. Uh, I think that uh, you, you have a, uh, some truth there. Um, I think as a community, the cardiologists were a bit slow uh, to get into the cholesterol-lowering uh, uh, business, so to speak. Um, th that has really been uh, the purview of the general internist, the general practitioner. But let me tell you, uh, it's changing, and it's changing rapidly. Um, I was at a meeting last weekend, and at, at UCLA, everybody who has a bypass operation is automatically put on a statin drug. And they told the story of a fellow, uh, uh, a young intern who, who was writing these orders, and this patient had mitral valve replacement, not coronary disease. And so the, and they were sent home, and the referring doctor called back and said, well, why was my patient put on a statin drug? You know, he had a valve replacement, not, not atherosclerosis. Well, um, I, I had rather see that patient uh, uh, get on a statin drug who really didn't need it than all of these others who need it and not get on it. But I, I can tell you the studies are so overwhelming now that it's going to rapidly increase. And I can also tell you that there, there are at least two cases in the courts of the United States of people who've had heart attacks, total cholesterol levels, uh, 300 thereabout. They were not put on a, a cholesterol-lowering drug, and they're being sued. 
and this is, this unfortunately is the way a lot of things work. How I. Yes, uh, two points concerning women. First, if we get rid of the cows, that does mean milk. And those of us, I mean, all women have to worry about osteoporosis, uh, especially after menopause. And dr I drink like three glasses of skim milk a day. Now, is that, is that something I should eliminate? And if so, how do you see Skim milk is great. Uh, it's wonderful. As long as you take the fat out of milk, it's wonderful. Okay, and then the second point is, um, the studies of women's heart disease going up, is, are those studies based on women who are on hormone replacement therapy or are those women that do not take it? And what, yeah. what, how do you feel about that? Well, um, I think the true answer regarding um, hormone replacement therapy, uh, specifically estrogen uh, with or without uh, progesterone, is still up for grabs. Um, I think the, the answer to that uh, decision is easy if one has had a hysterectomy. If one's had a hysterectomy, uh, I, I don't see any, uh, any uh, contraindication for estrogen therapy unless there's a strong family history of breast cancer in that particular family. If not, uh, I would strongly advocate estrogen therapy. Now, there's a lot of evidence that the postmenopausal woman on estrogen therapy decreases frequency of heart attack by 50%. Now, what does that translate into? There are about 300,000 heart attacks in this nation in women each year. If that reduction is 50%, that means it goes down to 150,000. That is an enormously significant factor. Now, the cost of that is a three times increase in frequency of uterine cancer. But what is the frequency of uterine cancer? It's about 5,000 cases a year. So we're talking about reducing heart disease, 150,000 cases, and increasing uterine cancer from 5,000 to 15,000. Now, I think, it, I think it's worth it. Now, just because you have uterine cancer, nobody wants any cancer, of course, but I think the, the risk of heart disease is far greater than the risk of uterine cancer. But the true answer to the question will not be for three or four more years. Estrogen, I would put in the category of a magical drug. I mean, it's good for the bones, it's good for the arteries, um, it, it's, it, it's good for the skin. Um, the, the fright has been cancer of the breast, and there's only one published study that showed an increased frequency of cancer of the breast that I'm aware of. Um, so, it, Estrogen decreases cholesterol levels about 10%. You know, that's pretty good. I think it's an individual decision, though, until there's absolute firm data in it. Yes, sir. The, the endometrial cancer caused by estrogen therapy is a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma, which is well easily treated by a simple hysterectomy. It's not like... Uh, endometrial cancer from other causes. In fact, there are some gynecologists, uh, particularly at Duke, now recommending just, and they give the patients a choice, and I have elected to do, to do this, to give them only estrogen. If the patient will report any unusual bleeding and is adequately evaluated, then you do not have to worry about the progesterone, or you can, and the effect that, that it may have on the breast. There is some indication that progesterone is a bad hormone as far as the breast is concerned. So uh, I think estrogen and postmenopause lay with or without a uterus is fine. And you can get, 
use either way. I think the patient just has to have the choice and yeah. be well informed. I would agree with that. I, I, I think it, I'm not a woman, but I, I think it's personally worth the risk unless you have a strong family history of breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, for Is that right? Did you have another question? Men and women, as they are on a low cholesterol diet, would have a calcium deficiency or calcium being lower in the fact that they are eliminating dairy products and what have you. So uh, postmenopausal uh, women with uh, increase in incidence of coronary artery disease due to the fact that the atherosclerosis is uh, present and if you are going to be um, uh, recommending that they uh, lower their uh, uh, cholesterol or uh, fat in their diet, should they be also be taking calcium to prevent uh, osteoporosis-related uh, incidences? Well, that's a debatable issue. Uh, a lot of people recommend a supplementary calcium uh, uh, there are, as I mentioned, uh, there's one viewpoint that we take in too much protein. Uh, let's say we take in 15 grams of protein a day, we probably don't need more than 5 grams. The more protein we take in, the more calcium we lose. Um, I think supplementary calcium is fine. I don't, I don't have any, any problem with it unless you have a prosthetic valve uh, in place like a like a tissue valve and then I, I certainly would not take it because it calcifies those tissue valves very re readily yes ma'am prescribing the statute medications for those who perhaps are not following any type of uh, dietary intervention do you see any difference in results if they were just on meds or uh, versus taking meds versus dietary intervention? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, uh, there, there, are, uh, there are some physicians I can tell you that if a person is not willing to decrease the uh, amount of fat in a diet, that uh, they will not prescribe a lipid-lowering medicine. I think that is changing. Uh, the, one of the studies, uh, it was by Hunting Hack, compared people uh, who took a lipid-lowering drug uh, and stayed on their same diet, 40% of calories from fat, despite eating all that junk stuff, so to speak. Their total cholesterol fell 27%, or their LDL fell 27%, total fell about 22%. If they decrease their percent of calories from fat at the same time from 40% to 30%, they got a 5% additional boost. So the LDL uh, decreased not just 27%, but 32%. The, the decreasing fat in the diet works the same way that these drugs do. So they work synergistically. But let's say you have a, a heart attack and you're 70 years of age. Well, one of the great pleasures of life is eating. Now, if a person is unwilling to change his or her diet, I wouldn't make a strong judgment for or against that. I would just put them on the drug and get a 27% reduction. Now, if people are put on the drug and they can eventually become pure vegetarians, you're not gonna need these medicines. But not many of us are willing to do that. I mean, I know what I should put in my mouth at every meal, but I'm not willing to go to that, uh, I wouldn't say extreme, it's the good way to go. Uh, but uh, it's hard. Yes, ma'am. How early should What's your recommendation? Well, if you're a mother or father, or or some or, or family members have heart attacks in their 30s, 40s, boy, I'd get screened, period. Um, I get screened wherever it's done free. <laughs> <laughs> so I was at a meeting this last week and it was done free. I got, uh, you know, I got done. And I think it's important uh, when, you, when you get your tests done to write them down and keep it in your purse 
When you get your blood pressure recorded, ask your doctor or whoever to take, what is my blood pressure? And record it with your date. I keep it in my wallet. So, so if, if you have enough of these tests and then one's out of line, you know it's probably an error. It's the same way of weigh, uh, weighing every day. I think it's a very good thing to weigh every day. Same time each day, I weigh in the morning. Now, my number is 170. So if I'm over 170, by golly, I starve that day. And that makes it, you know, not a big deal. Uh, if I go have a huge dinner tonight, well, the next day, I gotta be careful. But I think all of us should have a number and stick with that number, live with it, do it every day, and, and then weight becomes a non-issue. And it's the most healthful thing we can do is to stay at, at ideal body weight. I think physical activity is wonderful. You know, you feel better with exercise. Uh, exercise is, is good for uh, thinking. Uh, a fewer, a fewer uh, runners, exercises go to psychiatrists compared to non-exercises. Uh, the gastrointestinal tract works better. Everything works better. Exercise is wonderful. But if you do as Clinton does and go out and run three miles and then stop at McDonald Burgers on the way home, I think you neutralize that. I think it's more healthy to be a non-meat-eating, non-exerciser than a meat-eating exerciser. Exercise is great, but it doesn't, it, it, it is not a substitute for what we put in our mouths. Yes, sir. I see women with uh, normal total cholesterol below uh, 200. Their HDL will be low, uh, stay below 35. You haven't mentioned HDL at all. Right. Yeah. Um, I think HDL is important. Um, the, the adult treatment panel uh, on cholesterol lowering, their recommendation, which, which is very interesting, is that you focus on LDL irrespective of what uh, HDL is. Now, uh, that sounds well and good, but what about the woman who comes in with a total cholesterol of 300 and an HDL of 100? What do you do with that person? Now, number one, when you see that, one's always looking at a woman. That just virtually never occurs in, in a man. So uh, you're a little blessed there with the higher HDL numbers. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, I agree with that recommendation that we should focus on the LDL. We really don't know the answer to that, however, when you have a high HDL and a relatively high um, uh, LDL. When the, when the HDL is low, it's always a problem. Now, there's not a good drug to raise HDL yet. Uh, the statin drugs, as wonderful as they are, they raise HDL about 7%. And they, it's about 7% at the low doses and at the high doses. It's not dose related. Uh, things like uh, losing weight is wonderful for the HDL. It goes up. Uh, exercise is wonderful for the HDL. Uh, there are those who've uh, found that uh, a glass of wine will, will raise the HDL. I don't recommend it unless you, you know, do it regularly. Uh, but nevertheless, nevertheless, what I'm trying to say is that there are things that raise our HDL which are better than drugs, whereas the drugs are the best for lowering LDL unless we're willing to go all the way to being a pure vegetarian. Yes, ma'am. and very high cholesterol, and I'm very strict diet, and so that then, and I don't take anything, because, and that made me to concentrate in, when I order for the lipid profile for the patient, I order lipid profile, and it comes usually with a, a coronary risk factor, and basically that's what the, uh, you know, the reports are, that the coronary risk factor is low, much lower, when they have a high HDL, and that's why I don't even recommend for those patients. Yeah. Uh, even their total cholesterol is elevated, not to worry about it. Well, I think, uh, I think that's the majority view among the medical profession. However, it's not the view of the adult treatment panel. 
The adult treatment panel says treat the LDL irrespective of the HDL. The bottom was that if the HDL is over 60, yes. then it should, you know, they should not be on medication yeah. because that will compensate. The truth is, we, they're just not long-term studies of, of these individuals. Now, I can give you an example of the opposite of that. Uh, there was a patient uh, at NIH when I was there who had a bypass operation, coronary bypass operation. He had 15 lipids, I mean 40 lipid studies over a 15 year period. His total cholesterol averaged 72. 72, and he had a bypass operation. Now what do you think his HDL was? It was one. So his ratio was 72. Now those are freaks. I mean that's, that's extremely uncommon. But the usual is a, is a HDL uh, 25, something like that. Now, how do you, how do you get that up? It's, a, it's always a problem. Well, I think niacin is a terrific drug. Uh, the problem with niacin is you have to start very slow. Uh, it's a mess. I took it 25 years ago with a group of uh, physicians uh, just to see what it was like. And we took a gram of this stuff, and it will blow your head off <laughs> if, if you're not careful with it. It's like dynamite. You really have to respect it. Now, that was before it was known that you should start uh, niacin with an aspirin tablet and very low doses, like 100 milligrams, and then work up a week or so to 200 and try to get to 1.5 grams, let's say. Well. Uh, that's plus or minus, I think. But at any rate, it's a good drug. You have to take it three times a day. If you stop for a week, you've got to start over again. Um, it has some problems, although it, it's a poor person's statin drug in a way. I'll tell you a funny story. I was on the airplane a while back, and I just sat down on the airplane. The announcement is, the, is there a doctor in the house? And I said, oh, God. <laughs> I probably won't know what's, uh, what's the matter. And so I went, the police come to the front of the airplane. So I went to the front of the airplane, and lo and behold, the, the airline uh, attendant was, was in a chair. And she was flushed, and she was perspiring. And I said, oh, my goodness, so what, what happened to you? And she said she was just about fainted and had to sit down. And um, I fortunately asked, I said, well, have you done anything differently today than you did yesterday or the previous day? Have you taken anything? She said, oh, yes. Before I left home, uh, she said, I was up all last night, and my roommate told me to take this medicine, and it would make me feel good all day today. And I said, well, do you have uh, th that bottle? And somebody went to a person, got it. Lo and behold, it was nice. And, and she <laughs> took it. Uh, to hopefully uh, give a little uh, energy all day long. It can be a problem. Yes? Uh, a diabetic is destined to have uh, high cholesterol because I already take a, a cholesterol lowering drug and I was already uh, lowering my fats before they uh, started the, the drugs and I still am high. My, my numbers are still high. Well, maybe you need to be on a higher dose. I think it is a superb idea for any diabetic to be on a statin drug um, uh, because um, uh, atherosclerosis, as a rule, uh, is greater in the diabetic compared to the non-diabetic. There are not extensive studies yet to, to show that if diabetics are on these statin drugs over a long period of time, that they will do a lot better than the diabetics not on those drugs, but almost certainly uh, the advantage will be there. In the uh, 4S study, the CARE study, all of those studies showed even greater benefit in the diabetics versus the non-diabetics. If you're not on an ACE inhibitor, I'd do that too. If I had diabetes, I'd be on a lipid-lowering statin drug and an ACE inhibitor. We see a lot of Females with high triglycerides, what effect and what should we do about that? And does niacin work when, in ladies with high triglycerides? Uh, well, I've heard it does not. Yeah, I, I think my own view is that there's, there's excessive focus on the triglycerides versus the LDL. 
Now, if the triglycerides are 1,000 or 2,000, you know, you've got to do something about them because the triglycerides, when they're quite high, uh, can lead to pancreatitis, which can be life-threatening, you know, and be fatal. So if they're way up there, you have to do something about them. But if they're in the 400 range, uh, my goodness, I would focus, I would focus on the LDL. Uh, it turns out, as you know, that the higher the triglycerides, the lower the HDL. So if you can get the triglycerides down, it tends to raise the HDL. The statin drugs uh, lower, um, across the board, lower triglycerides about 25%. But if you look at the group that start out with higher triglycerides, they lower them even more than that. We're talking about 40%. So, my view is, is to push the statin drugs to maximum dose because triglycerides are a little dose related. HDL is not. LDL is dose related. Uh, rather than trying to go to Jim Fibrazil or Fibrate or, or nicotinic acid. That's got to be our last question. Thank you for right Thank now. Thank you, Let me. <laughs> that was very, very nice, Dr. Roberts. Uh, Dr. Lisa Clark is here. We'll take the podium for a few minutes as a facilitator.